Hello, welcome to this lesson on covalent bonding. The question of the day, what does the prefix co mean? What are some other words that begin with the same prefix? And what do you think covalent bonding might entail? We already know that a metal can bond to a nonmetal by transferring its electrons, forming an ionic bond. But that's not the only way that atoms can bond to each other. In fact, sometimes we will have two nonmetals bond to each other. Think of two compounds you already know, water and carbon dioxide. You know those formulas, H2O and CO2. Well, neither of those compounds contains a metal. It's entirely nonmetals. So th the question is, how is this going to work if both of our compounds, uh, I'm sorry, if both of the elements in our compounds are looking to gain electrons, how could that possibly work? Well, because they can't both gain electrons, they actually compromise by sharing their electrons. Hence the prefix co. A covalent bond is when two nonmetals are going to share their electrons. Their valence orbitals are going to overlap. They are covalent. Any compound that forms covalent bonds is called a molecular compound. Remember, if we have a compound that has ionic bonds, we call it a salt. Anytime we have a compound with covalent bonds, we will call it a molecular compound. Molecular compounds properties are often very different from that of ionic compounds. They are going to have very low melting points. Think of sugar. If you've ever made jam or caramel, sugar melts. Um, you can even burn sugar. It is more likely to be a gas or a liquid. Think of water and carbon dioxide. Covalent substances usually don't dissolve very easily in water. There are some, like sugar, you know, dissolves in water, but most molecular compounds or compounds with covalent bonds don't really like to bond or dissolve in water. These compounds are not going to conduct electricity. They are going to be non-conductors. And a little bit more on this later when we get into intermolecular forces, but these compounds are going to create partial charges because they have electrons being shared, and that's going to be based on their electronegativity. Again, we'll talk more on that later. I'm alluding here to bond polarity. We already know about polyatomic ions, and you have been, if you've been following my videos in this course, you've been looking at covalent bonds for a while and maybe didn't even know it. Most polyatomic ions are actually held together by covalent bonds, meaning that we have in our bundle of atoms, they're all going to be sharing their electrons, but overall they're going to wind up with a negative or a positive charge, usually negative. So a metal is going to try to bond to that bundle of covalent atoms that somehow gathered a charge, forming an ion. So you have a metal ion and the poly ion, and they are going to form an ionic bond. But if you just zoomed in and looked at the poly, you would have covalent bonds. So here in this example, we have calcium hydroxide. Calcium is a metal with a plus two charge, and hydroxide is a polyatomic ion carrying a minus one charge. The hydrogen and the oxygen have not transferred electrons. In fact, they're sharing electrons. Their valences are overlapped, but they're overlapped in such a way that overall they're going to wind up with a minus one charge, and that is going to be a covalent bond within an ionic bond. So in blue, we have the covalent bond. We have uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and they're sharing electrons. And then we have calcium, who is going to bond to the hydroxide ionically. A lot of the time with polyatomic ions, when they're bonded into a compound, that compound will have both ionic and covalent bonds at the same time. To polish off this lesson, see if you can figure out if the compound listed has ionic bonds, covalent bonds, or both ionic and covalent bonds. Sodium chloride, or NaCl, I'm sure you know at this point, is ionic. Sodium is the metal. Chlorine is the nonmetal. They're going to transfer their electrons. Then we have lithium hydroxide. And just like I had mentioned, the hydroxide ion is covalently bonded. The O and the H are covalently bonded together, forming hydroxide. And then that ion is going to ionically bond to the lithium. So within the ionic bond, you have a smaller covalent bond. The same is going to be true for the iron, uh, the iron one carbonate. <laughs> the atoms in the carbonate are going to be covalently bonded to each other, and then the carbonate is going to bond to two irons um, ionically. 
Then we have CO2, which you may or may not know is carbon dioxide. Um, that has a covalent bond, easy to spot because there's no metal. Same for H2O, there's no metal, so we know that water is a covalently bonded compound. And then last up, we have copper to chloride. Copper obviously is the metal, chlorine is the non-metal, and that is going to have ionic bonds. So that's it on distinguishing ionic and covalent bonds and the properties of molecular compounds. If there's any questions, please leave them in the comments section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and I'll see you there. Bye.